Okay. All right, well. Are we good? Yes. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this is the Sioux Climate Hub uh, webinar series. And uh, I'll just give you a little brief introduction to the Sioux Climate Hub. Um, our mission is to act as a catalyst for diverse climate actions in the Sault Ste. Marie area. Um, those are going to be informed by global trends and national policies, but really our focus is on issues and actions that are specifically relevant to local citizens. Uh, we have both a Facebook page and you can also contact us by email as uh, shown here. Um, the current focus is through our Facebook and webinar series. But post-COVID, uh, we certainly hope to expand our public outreach through various face-to-face -face events. Uh, notably, there are no membership fees and we are certainly looking for new members. So as a member, as a network of like-minded citizens, we really would like to get your ideas for activities, your hand in promotion and completion of those activities, and your continued encouragement of climate change awareness. Uh, so on that note, I would like to say that I would like to ask uh, Juliana Lesage Corbier uh, from Batchewana First Nation to lead us with the land acknowledgement. All right. Uh, morning, everyone. My English name is Juliana Lesage Corbier, but the name given to me through ceremony is the one who stands in the center. I am a member of Batchewana First Nation and also a member of the Wolf Clan, uh, I stand as um, a proud Anishinaabe woman, and I wanted to acknowledge the traditional territory, um, Sault Ste. Marie, but also within our language is Baoting, uh, the place of the rapids. Also, when we do the land acknowledgement, uh, I want to acknowledge those that continue to sustain us, all of our relations, from the species to the wildlife that to continue to give us life, um, especially our mother earth. Just wanted to acknowledge that um, National Indigenous Peoples Day was on Monday. Um, and we do see um, the heaviness um, and the, you know, the hurt that's going on, but we must not forget the resilience um, and the resurgence happening within our communities um, far and wide. So miigwech and I'm really happy to join you today and really excited to hear Kim speak. <clears throat> Thanks so much for that, Juliana. Um, share my Thank screen. you, Juliana. Um, so at this point, um, um, I'm just going to turn it over to uh, to Kim to um, to begin her own presentation. Um, one of the things about Kim is she's a a great bike enthusiast. So uh, Kim, please, um, please take it away. Can you guys see my presentation now? Yes, it's fine. Great. great. Um, thank you, Rob, and thanks so much, Juliana, for, for that introduction and land acknowledgement. Um, I just want to let you all know that right up front that I'm not a climate or scientific expert. Um, in my day job, I'm a biologist, and I'm a lifelong cyclist. I um, am concerned about the climate. I ride a lot for transportation, but right now in my life, mostly for recreation. And um, I started riding as a kid, you know, like so many people, um, three or four years old. I grew up in small towns in Alberta and my bike was my freedom. I really, I used it to get around and do anything I wanted to do. And it was always a big part of my life. Um, I moved away from home to go to university and uh, I went to the University of Victoria and I didn't have a car, I couldn't afford one, I didn't have access to a car. And so I used my bike for everything, like for getting to school, for getting my groceries, going out at night, everything I did, I did with my bike. And um, a couple summers into living there, I um, met up with some other friends and they, they were kind of in a similar situation and we all kind of got into bike touring together. and mountain biking and, and things like that. And um, 
we didn't really know what we were doing at the time, but we kind of learned through some hard lessons. Um, we didn't really have any um, here for anything, but uh, we made do and we had a great time. And, and uh, I've lived in Sault Ste. Marie for, for about 20 years now. And since being here, I've been pretty active in the cycling community. I, I do a lot of mountain biking, but I also got into road and cyclocross riding here um, and racing bikes a little bit in different disciplines. I've done some trail building, some bike event organizing, and I've taught some bike handling skills to women and kids. And, and so that's my cycling background. Um, I don't want you guys to think that I only um, ride a bike for transportation. I don't. I share a, uh, share a car with my partner, Lisa, and, um, and we, we do drive a, a fair bit. So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think everyone should ride. Um, it's focused more on, on cycling for transportation, but how cycling and being a cyclist might be better for the climate. And then also try and share some tips um, that I've learned over the years to try and make cycling more comfortable, safer, and, and more fun. And I hope at the end there's a bit of time and we can have some questions and maybe you guys have some other ideas or tips you want to share with me. And I would, I would love to hear those too. So, in putting together this presentation, I, um, I came across a study um, that was reported on in Bike Radar, which is a, an article from the UK. It came out last fall, and it's reporting on a study that looked at the carbon cost of cycling and compared it to other forms of transportation. So riding an electric bike, walking, busing, and driving gas or electric vehicles. And to do this work, they use life cycle analysis which adds up all the sources of emissions for the entire lifespan of a product, from the extraction of the raw material through all the manufacturing and product use, all the way to the end, like the recycling or final disposal of that product, and then dividing by the amount of useful output or work that product can provide over its lifespan. So for a car or bike, it's the number of kilometers traveled. It also includes the emissions from producing the extra food required to fuel a cyclist per kilometer or the energy to, to fuel a vehicle. And so what they found is shown in this graph with the grams of carbon dioxide emitted per kilometer resulting for each of these types of transportation. So traditional um, non-electric biking is shown here at approximately 21 grams of CO2 emitted per kilometer, which is better than walking at 56 um, grams CO2. And that's because about three quarters of the emissions from biking and essentially all the emissions from walking come from fueling those activities. Cycling is much more efficient than walking per kilometer, so it has less than, than um, half of the CO2 emissions from walking. E-bikes, despite the additional emissions from battery manufacturing, disposal, and electricity, they, they actually only have, um, only emit 15 grams CO2 per per passenger kilometer and using them. And that's because it takes so much less fuel, so much less energy to power an e-bike. A gas powered car results in about 270 grams CO2 per kilometer. So almost 13 times more than a, than a bike. And an electric car is about 90 grams or a little more than four times um, the emissions of a bike. So there are a whole bunch of assumptions that go into this kind of life cycle analysis. So I'm sure these numbers aren't totally accurate, but I think that the relative differences um, are, are probably pretty good and, and they're kind of interesting. And if you want to read more about those assumptions, um, check out the article here. But to me, what really surprised me, and this is probably isn't new to you guys, but how efficient an e-bike and an e-car is. And also that that three quarters of the of the um, the CO2 emitted per kilometer on a bike is related to the food use so that you can ride that bike. And um, you don't have to pay attention to the numbers on this chart here. And I'm sure that, that most of you guys know that energy and food production are the two big sources of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Energy accounts for two thirds to three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions, but emissions from food production are really significant. And this is a chart from our world in data that was put together by Hannah Ritchie and it's dated uh, June, 2021. Um, and it's looking at five interventions to reduce global food global food production emissions over the next 30 years. And um, again, this is well beyond my expertise. And I, I know that there's been a couple talks in this series that have related to agriculture and composting and food waste. So 
check out those um, recorded talks if you're interested. They're by Lauren Morin on regenerative agriculture and then Paul Hazlitt last month on on composting. But anyway, so for these five interventions, some of them are more producer level changes like high yields and having food waste, um, best farm practices. Well, having food waste is, is composting as well. But a lot of these other ones, uh, healthy calories and plant rich diet are things that we as individuals and as cyclists can choose to lower that uh, 21 grams of CO2 per kilometer that, that we emit by by riding. And, and I would say that I know for me, the more that I'm riding, the more I want to eat healthier. And so those are kind of things that I think um, even when you're off the bike, they, they could help um, to reduce our, our carbon footprint. Beyond reducing your personal um, CO2 emissions by riding rather than driving, some of the other benefits to the climate, particularly of commuting by bike, um, so that active transportation, are those one less car arguments. And this is especially when it's you know, a busy time of day and there's lots of cars on our roadways, but there's less congestion, less idling at stoplights, less wear and tear on roads, reduced need to expand roadways and fewer parking lots. Beyond that, economically, it's much more economical for an individual to ride than to drive. And there are a number of health, um, physical and mental um, health and well-being benefits. And I've listed those here. And, and this is really where, why I love to ride and why I find jo joy in it. For me, um, the connection to the community and the environment that I get on a bike is unlike anything else. Um, it's super fun. You can go fast on it, so it's much it's much more rewarding to me than than walking um, because I can go farther. I also feel like being on a bike, you're part of the environment. Your senses are um, much more available to you than being inside of a vehicle. So, and I know I talk to cyclists and and things markers that are um, markers that impact them. I'll I'll differ between cyclists, but for me, I always like that first ride in the spring when I'm wearing shorts and you know you can feel the wind in your legs and I just love that feeling. Also like the first ride in the evening in the spring when I hear keepers, um, all those kinds of things. Getting out of, outside of your vehicle really puts you in touch with what's going on around you and you're never more aware of the weather, than what the wind is doing when, than when you're on a bike. I also find um, like physically it's a good workout. I enjoy that work. Um, but I know a lot of people that ride that aren't really into that part of it and they can still get around effectively on a bike and, and do a lot of things that they want to do, you know, over short distances without pushing themselves super hard. Um, for me, riding is also, can be really meditative, especially on trails and especially on, on more technical single track mountain bike trails where you really need to be in the moment um, because you need to concentrate on what you're doing. It can be super fun to share these experiences with other people. And um, cycling provides for a lot of um, group riding and community-based activities. And riding is a really great way to learn about a place. You can, like I said, go, go a lot farther more easily than walking or more quickly than walking. And there are so many more areas that are accessible on a bike that you can't get to in a car. Um, little shortcuts and alleyways and things like that. So many of these benefits aren't directly tied to our climate, but I think that they help connect us to our environment and that being healthier and being well helps us to care more about ourselves and our environment and each other. And so I think that there are other important reasons to ride. And, and kind of my last part uh, for this talk in, in Why to Ride is that I think we live in an incredible place for riding. I've I've ridden um, in many places across Canada and the US, and I'm always happy to come home and be on our roads and trails. We have this great diversity, all different kinds of surfaces to ride on. We have some of the greatest mountain biking of anywhere I've ever ridden. Um, the cycling infrastructure here, like right now, we have an amazing mayor and council for, for cycling infrastructure. The kinds of advances that have been made in the 20 years that I lived here are astounding, um, even in the last 10 years, you know. We didn't used to have a hub trail or a pump track. Um, the, the mountain biking trails at Hiawatha weren't actually legitimately uh, used. We have, um, and when we started mountain biking up there, when I moved here and started mountain biking up there, you know, it was a lot of 
double track riding to connect with the single track. There's way more trails there now and there's a cycling master plan and things like that. Um, so uh, in the last year, we've had a lot more painting of bike lanes around the city. There's been um, federal funding announcements for trail development on Finn Hill and, and Farmer Lake. There's been trail improvements that the cycling club has done on the fiscal system at Hiawatha, winter grooming for fat biking trails. And our, this last winter, we had those winter walking trails that, that the city had put around, um, around town, and those turned out to be pretty great for riding. Another great reason is as St. Marie is not that big of a city, so there are some streets um, that I avoid, especially at certain times of day. But really, we have great conditions for year-round cycling here, and it's a small enough city that it really doesn't take that much longer, if it even takes longer to ride places. So right now, I'm living and working at home, but normally I ride uh, to work, and I work a kilometer away, so it's super easy for me. Riding would take the same amount of time as driving, but it's a lot faster than walking. Um, most of my commuting around town is by is by bike, and if I have to go downtown or I want to go to a business somewhere, um, you know, pre-COVID, going out to listen to live music, it's just so easy to take my bike, and you, you don't have to worry about parking anywhere. You can go directly there. It has a lot of fun. Even going to ride my bike at Hiawatha. For me to drive up there, it takes me 15 or at most 20 minutes. Riding up there adds about 10, maybe 15 minutes if there's a strong north wind. It's not, it's not a really onerous thing to do to ride a bike in St. Paul's Way. I don't find it's one of the best places I've ever ridden a bike. So um, the next part of my talk focuses more on on bikes, um, getting a bike and starting to ride, making it easy for you to commute. Um, so there's some gear tips that, that I've learned, and then some other bike sense and defensive riding skills to, to try and make uh, biking on the road safer for you and, and make you more comfortable doing that. So I'm super privileged. Bikes are my passion. I own multiple bikes, and I know that's not the situation that a lot of people are in, and it certainly wasn't the situation that I was in for, for a long time, but I do have a few bikes, and I'm going to show you the three bikes that I really love. Um, Sault Ste. Marie and with a focus on being able to commute on them but also maybe using them for some other things. So this is my dedicated commuter bike and um, it looks a little bit rough but it gets it gets really well really well used. I use this bike all the time for, for going to work normally and also going downtown you know getting my hair cut going to uh, going to the bank anything like that like small less than five kilometer um, sort of trips um, so flat handlebar, it's got a little bit of wider saddle, you can't see on this, but a nice upright position. I've got a bell on it for riding on the hub trail. It's got good brakes. I also have fenders on it, which are really awesome for being able to ride in the rain um, and not just not worrying about that, not worrying about getting soaked um, from water splashing up from the road and things like that, not getting that tail up, up your back from riding through a puddle. I've got lights and reflectors that I keep on it so it's ready for evening riding or night riding. It's got a great gear range for riding roads in town. And then it's got a nice wide tire with some tread on it. Um, the tires are more puncture resistant than other tires. So they're heavier, but they, they help me to not get flat. And then I've got a, a back rack on here and I always carry a, a pannier that I can put stuff in easily. And the thing that is always in there is a bike lock. So that I can leave it around town. And we do have bike theft in Sault Ste. Marie. From my understanding, a lot of the bikes that get stolen are, are locked up with a really uh, flimsy cable lock that's super easy to cut. And there's a lot of different bike locks and they can be you know, quite expensive and it really depends on what kind of bike you're trying to protect or where you're parking and that kind of thing. But we have great bike shops in Sault Ste. Marie and I'd really encourage you to, to have that conversation with your bike shop um someone who works in a bike shop to tell you what what would be the best bike lock for for your needs if you're doing longer commuting like if i was riding regularly more than 10 kilometers or so to work then i would move to a more aerodynamic efficient bike and this is a picture of a gravel bike but a road bike would be similar so a drop handlebar i find these a lot more comfortable for 
for longer riding, even though you're bent over more. So it could be a little bit harder on your neck if you have issues that way. But it's faster, it's lighter, it's, it's much more efficient, it's much quicker. We typically have bigger gears than what we would find on a commuter. Um, they are definitely more expensive, so you want to make sure that you have that bike locked up securely, or if you can take it inside in a place um, where you're working or whatever, then, then that's ideal. And same thing with a mountain bike, they typically cost more than a, than a commuter bike, so you might want to keep that in mind. Mountain bike is designed for off-road riding, so much more rugged terrain. It's got um, bigger uh, disc rotors, so more, more powerful brake, brakes. Mine has a suspension fork and shock on it, so that helps to absorb all those um, impacts and just rougher terrain. Same with the wider rims and tires, which give you much better traction. It also has a lot more easy gears on it for climbing steeper trails. And same thing, like this bike is great uh, for commuting, but you'd want to make sure that it's locked up well. And with this and the gravel bike, when you don't have a, a back rack on your bike, then you know, you're usually wearing a backpack and then you might want to change when you get to where you're going so it's probably going to be a steady back. The next thing, um, once you have your bike set up, or you have a bike, I guess, is um, make sure it's easy and comfortable. And this makes getting on your bike to do those errands and to do those, you know, small trips much easier and faster and just makes it that much more efficient. So I keep my gear in one place and it's ready to go. So I keep my helmet on my handlebars. Now, helmets are not required by law in Ontario if you're over 18. I wear one all the time. Anytime I get on a bike, I have one on. Um, I also keep a pump nearby so I can put some air in my tires if I need to. And same thing with chain leads. It's not shown, but I, I have chain leads um, in my shower for my bike so I can quickly put that on. I have it dark proof because I've got the lights and reflectors on it. It's all weather ready, again, because it's got fenders. I use a rainproof saddle cover that you can use a bag or anything like that. So when you're parking your bike outside for um, a few hours and it turns out that that is a rainy day that you hadn't planned on, when you come out, you can take that off and then you have a dry bomb on your way home instead of a wet one. Um, I also change and put set of tires on my bike in the winter and these things are awesome. Like they really work so well on all of our trails and, and roads like the um, Hub trail, if it's cleared enough that you can ride it, or those winter walking trails, when they're hard packed enough that you can ride on them, um, it just really helps protect you um, from going down if it's icy at all. And then again, the rear rack with the fun green and the um, And uh, I've been collecting gear for a long time because I ride a lot. And so I just made this picture of a lot of the gear that I really love for riding. And this is like next level, you know, embrace your bike nerd them. But um, so for me on a rainy day or throughout the winter when I'm riding to work, because I have a short commute, I just put on um, this Gore-Tex pants and a jacket over top of whatever my work clothes are. I don't work up enough of the sweat that I need to change and then I can just take this off at work. It takes me two minutes, so fast and efficient, I love it. I also wear a buff and I pull that up over my head like this, so it's over my ears and that adds a ton of warmth. I put a really light tooth on over top um, and then my helmet on over top of that. And then I put a helmet cover on and that um, has some reflectivity on it, but it also just cuts down on the wind going through the vents of the helmet. So it's, it's kind of a nice piece. And the, the reflectivity, um, it's nice to have this on your clothing for when you're riding, you know, earlier in the morning or later um, after work when in the winter time when it's getting dark later it's getting dark uh, <laughs> earlier and it's getting light later in the morning so you have a little bit more you're a little bit more visible for mountain biking um, in addition to a helmet I always wear glasses because it's easy to get uh, brush in your face and same thing with gloves I like to open with gloves for riding gloves anytime are a good idea I don't always use them commuting because I commute so short but it's good to have that hand protection if something happens and you do end up you know, on the sidewalk or whatever, um, asphalt, then you don't scrape up your hand. You can get gloves that are better for riding in the rain, and these ones here are winter riding gloves. They just have a lot more insulation. And on that, if you're someone who gets really cold hands and feet in the winter like I do, then there's these pogies that you can also put on your 
on your bars and then you don't have to have a giant knit on that you can't shift and break effectively with it allows you to have um a slightly thinner glove so that you have some control but you can still get that work same thing in the winter i wear boots and these are actually cycling boots but you can wear any kind of boot that you could know she were walking like the tall Terrell is probably not a good idea because you need to be able to stretch your ankle um but but those are good and then I got a pair of ski goggles a few years ago as a gift and these are amazing for winter riding because they just they just make your eyes warm and I didn't even know what that sensation was like until I tried cycling with them and they're wonderful and I need to really own but I don't um Cycling shoes uh, are again not necessary, um, but they're something that makes that um, pedaling more efficient. So if you're riding a lot, or um, what I have some problems with plantar fasciitis, and so not having that extra suction in the shoe is really good for me. So a nice stiff sole is what really makes a cycling shoe a cycling shoe and good toe coverage. But um, some of these, like these ones here, I ride um, bikes that have clipless pedal so it's like a cleat on the pedal and you can snap your shoe into that you have to twist it hard to get out but that makes for a super efficient energy transfer system um i also use these booty covers quite a lot so if it's raining or it's just cold i'll put them on at the top of my shoe and they add a lot of work and, and keep your feet dry if it's raining so that's bikes and gear and and all that i can share with you that way when you're really getting started commuting or even if you already commute a lot take some time and check out these other routes that might exist in your neighborhood these these are all over the too um places that aren't really accessible to cars so much but that you can ride and that will make your biking experience more fun for a lot of these they're not really um skinny road bike tire suitable but having a wider tire um, and some good bike handling skills and, and you can go a lot of a lot of places and this is also a good way to learn those bike handling skills away from traffic and on some sort of different surfaces and that kind of thing this is just an alley in my neighborhood that i ride all the time this is the the trail road um behind lock city dairy that i use as a black road bypass between mcnab and second line it gets really wet if you have a lot of rain and there's some angular big cobble on it but it's a lot of fun and then Highway 17 East, if you're going out to Garden River, or Echo Bay, or Sylvan Valley. Um, so this is on the south side of the road, the river's over here. The four lanes, 70 kilometers an hour. There's no really defined shoulder here. The curve is like a 90 degree. It's just, it's a little bit sketchy sometimes. And traffic's moving fast down here. But if you have a wider tired bike, then this trail here is super fun. Like it's single track and there's sand and a bit of gravel on it and some whoopity woo so you need to be a little bit careful you also need to be aware that motorists coming out here might not be aware of you so you, you want to make sure that you're looking for them and making eye contact with them but but this adds a lot of fun to my rides out east um every province and a lot of municipalities have some kind of bike manual that explains the highway traffic act of their jurisdiction relevant to cyclists. This is one that I really like um, called Bike Sense. It's actually from DC. The link is here if you're interested in it. I just thought I'd go through. They have um, five main points, and I think that these are, are pretty useful. The first one is maintain your bike in good working order. And so every ride, when you when you go to go for a ride, ABC, so air your tires, brake for grid, and your chain is gauge. Um, the second off, be as visible to pos as possible to others. And I think this is the biggest thing about defensive riding and being on riding anywhere is there's lights and reflectors on your bike and clothing and those are important. Making sure that you're seeing, you might want to wear, you know, a yellow jacket or those kinds of things that stand out to people and so motorists can see. But there's also a lot to just riding visibly, being assertive and communicating with people on the road, especially motorists, but also pedestrians, making eye contact with them, moving out from the curb so that you're in traffic, so they're where you're where they expect to see you. Um, those things to me are, are really important. Also learning the skills you need to, you need to control your bike. So all those bike handling skills 
And those you get by practicing, and I'm going to have a slide at the end that deals more with those. Um, also, one of the big things is obviously cycling in traffic safely and predictably. So again, defensive riding, being alert always to what people are doing around you and thinking and planning where you're going to go, what you're going to do. And then finally, know and obey the rules and right. So bikes are vehicles under the Highway Traffic Act. There's a few differences, like you're not allowed to ride on a 400 degree highway, but it's not really relevant to us here. The biggest thing probably is riding on the right hand side of the road um, and stopping where you're, you're supposed to be stopping or yielding. Um, so that first part, the A, Bs, and Cs. So air in your tires, know how to inflate your um, your tire, what kind of valve stem you have on your wheel. So maybe it's a little skinny presser one, so you can see this, where you actually have to undo the end of the valve, put your pump on, push the air in, and then close it like this once you've got your, your tire up to pressure. Or it could be a Schrader valve, um, like is on a car tire. So know those things about your bike because you want to carry with you a spare tube whenever you're riding. Like um, this is the most common road or trail side um, maintenance issue is a flat tire. So even if you're never going to fix your flat yourself, but I would encourage everybody to learn how to do that. It's really not hard. I would say make sure that you have a tube that works for your tire and make sure you know how to get your wheel on and off your bike because. When you know those things, um, someone might stop and help you if you're riding in a group, then you have that tube to use and you're not using someone else's that may or may not fit your bike. So just um, read off the numbers on the side of your tire that will say what size it is and that will give you an indication of what, what size tube you need or take a picture of it and take it into the bike shop and have them give you the right tube. Other things that I carry on in my, for the roadside um, tool, the bike repair kit are separate patches in case I have multiple flats and then I can patch a tube while I'm riding. Um, tire levers and those are used to get the tire on and off the, sorry, just off the rim. Um, I carry tire boots that these are um, kind of a, a sticky plastic, thick piece, piece of thick cardboard that you can use if you get a gash in your tire and you need to repair that so that the tube doesn't poke through and cause another flat. So you just stick one of those inside the tire. I always carry a, a good pump with me because I don't like, um, I, I just don't like messing around with flat tires. I've had a lot of them in my life. But I also often carry, and this is just for emergency use, which mainly is an exposure thing for me. So it, in the winter when I'm riding, my hands get really, really cold if I have to take my gloves off to do anything. So I carry a CO2 inflator, um, and so this is meant to inflate your tire. It's a one-shot deal, so it's really not very environmentally friendly. So again, I use a pump um, whenever I can. And then a couple other things that I found to be really handy are zip ties and some electrical tape. Um, you know, if the cable comes loose or something like that, it's really easy to secure that when you're riding. Uh, Multi-tool that works for the bolts on your bike. I carry a set of pliers, but I don't know that anybody else uses them, but I've used them a few times. And then um, I've got a, a chain brake tool um, because that's probably my second most common bike failure, bike mechanical issue on the trail or road. And it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen every once in a while. And the other thing I carry that that is used to fix that besides the chain repair tool is a, is a master wrench and that needs to be the same width as your chain. And so I, I do some of my mechanic stuff for my bikes at home. And so I, I, I just had this uh, chain around so I want to show you. It's got, you need to get a chain if you're replacing a chain that works for the size that you have. And I know this is, this come up a lot with other people. So anyway, this is a 10 speed chain and this is a 10 speed link here. And I think this is 11 speed because one of my, my mountain bike has an 11 speed set on it. But what you're looking for here is the number of rods that you have on the set here. And I have 10, that means I need a 10 speed chain. Um, moving a chain, really important. So what I do for that is I, I put on gloves and this 
this move is really good. It works really well. It's probably not the most environmentally friendly move. So you could talk to your bike shop about that. It's what I've used for a long time. A bottle lasts a long time. Um, it's, I always put on gloves. I put my bike against the wall. I grab a rag and then I pedal backwards to clean off my chain, holding the rag around around the chain nice and tight. And then when I go to put the lube on, I put it on, pedal backwards, put the lube on, pedal backwards. And then um, I leave it for a little bit and wipe the excess uh, chain lube off. There are so many videos online about doing everything that you ever wanted to do on a bike, like anything so you can build a bike yourself in videos on YouTube. Some of the mechanic ones that I really like are by Global Cycling Network, GCN, and by Park Tools. So I recommend checking those out. Um, bike accidents. So getting back to that bike sense um, manual, bike accidents are terrible. Um, most of them are really minor. They're falling accidents that you do completely on your own, stopping, speeding, diverting, um, that means that going over railway tracks. And these take out railway tracks take out a lot of riders. So these are things to be aware of and that you can avoid mainly through good bike handling, getting used to riding um, over these kinds of things or avoiding them. Of motorist cyclist collisions, and this again is information from that bike sense manual, they mostly happen at intersections. And interestingly, they're much more frequent to happen at intersections without any kind of traffic control. So traffic lights, there aren't that many bike accidents at, at places with traffic lights, but if these are the driveways and things like that that um, cause more motorist cyclist collisions. And the errors there are usually cyclists riding without due care or on the wrong side of the road. And by a motorist, their failure to yield right away or what they call the left hook or right hook. And I'll show you that uh, in a couple slides what, what those mean. But these are really related to visibility. So the cyclist scale is really important in reducing those rates of accidents and that bike handling, but also riding visibly and defensively. So intersections. Again, riding defensively, being alert and thinking and planning what you're going to do. So if you're moving over into the left hand lane here, plan that back here. Make sure your shoulder checks in. Signal if it's safe for you to do so. Often it's not that, that easy to signal when you're on a bike because you're using your your arms to steer, but you can communicate in other ways, you know, making that contact with that driver behind you, moving your body over so that they know that, that you're moving moving in that direction. Um, yeah, tonight I was riding home and this guy, I, I was on my bike and another guy was coming this way and I was waiting for him and, and he didn't take his hand off the bar to signal and he just said, I'm turning right. And so that's another good way to communicate is you use your voice. Um, being visible, ensuring you're away from the curb to increase your, your visibility also helps um, people to see you. Be prepared always, watching for vehicles who might turn across your path and be prepared to avoid them. Um, oh, at always stop. So a lot of us, you know, like to track stand and practice that while we're at an always stop. You're supposed to legally put your foot down on the ground to indicate that you stop and you and you're yielding and it seems to go a long way in, in just communicating especially at those four-way stops to anyone else coming at the same time that you're stopping and you're waiting for them to go like you're obeying the rules of the road everybody gets through the intersection a lot faster that way so these are those three uh, motorist errors that i just wanted to, to show pictures of so this is the first one where the motorist doesn't yield you know they pulled up to the stop sign and quite likely they just didn't see you and so being out from the curb, being visible, using your lights and reflectors and things like that if you're out at night, but also just being aware and make sure you make eye contact with that driver so that they see you. And if they don't see you, if you haven't been able to make, make eye contact, then slowing down and being prepared that they're probably going to turn out in front of you. The right hook is, this, this happens a lot. <laughs> I don't actually get hooked, but where a motorist drives by slowly and then they turn right. And so you want to make sure if anyone's getting it slowly, slowly going by you and you have any inkling that they might turn right, don't pull up alongside them. I often try and if whenever any vehicle goes by me, I get behind them and just I'm, I'm not in their way at all if they do turn right and I'm ready to brake if I need to. The left hook is when a 
vehicles coming down from here and they turn left in front of you. And again, this happens, they probably don't see you. Maybe you're behind a vehicle here that just went through and they were waiting for the last vehicle on the line to go through. So be aware that happens. Make sure you're making eye contact. Maybe giving yourself space from the time that, if there's no vehicles behind you, um, giving yourself space so that that vehicle, um, if you know someone's gonna got their turn signal on, the vehicle ahead of you has time to clear um, and get away from you so that they can actually see you before you, uh, you go straight through. I get really excited about the intersection. <laughs> this is one where I think the city will probably change this right now, but this is Black Road and Second Line. And so um, if anyone's driven that in the last, well, probably almost a year now, you know that there's a right hand turn lane now going on to Second Line from Black Road. And on Second Line, any of the traffic that's coming through here um, and turning south on, on Black Road no longer has to yield. So that's a free flowing merge. And um, there's no signage here for cyclists whatsoever. The speed limit here is 60, but most of the time I find the flow of traffic is happening at 70 or 80 kilometers an hour. So be aware of this situation. And what I would really recommend doing, what I've been doing for riding um, on this is in, when it's safe for you to go straight through, you know, this truck should be yielding to you if you're here before, well, if it's turning, um, is riding onto this apron here. And then this apron has a really smooth gradual edge all the way around it. And so you have time on this apron to yield to any of those vehicles that are coming um, off of second line and turning south on Black Road. And then you can just cross right over here and make a nice, nice way onto the shoulder from there. Um, park cars and doors riding a meter out from park vehicles. Like this is really close to where this door is opening and this happens. It doesn't happen a lot, but the situation, the scenario where I see this potentially happening is downtown on Queen Street and, you know, anywhere where there's a lot of parallel parts. Part. And so for me, riding in this situation, I move out and take more of the lane. Um, cars are usually pretty courteous and slow down, move right around um, to go around me, but I would say beware of this situation. And if you're a car driver, beware of this situation so you're not opening the your car door onto a cyclist. Another thing is big vehicles. So staying at a blind spot, communicating with them and, and trying to make eye contact as much as you can. Don't share a lane with them because they're too big. Beware when they turn right that they often move left, left first. And then um, on the highway especially, beware of wind gusts as they pass. And so often when a semi goes past you, it'll kind of suck you in a little bit. And just be beware that that's going to happen and just continue to steer straight but try not to be super um super rigid on your handlebars like just try and be smooth with it the the tighter your grip um the more quickly you react and it's in a bad way um i also find that when i'm riding on the highway i need to be more wary of rampant trucks than i do because I think that these drivers are probably less experienced driving big vehicles than, than semi drivers who are usually pretty courteous. Um, and so beware of those things. Things that you could do if, you, if you're really concerned about that are um, rear view mirrors that you can mount on your handlebar or put on your helmet. Some of them stick out from your helmet like that. And I just read recently about a rear light that you could get that actually is radar enabled somehow. And you can buy a thing to mount your phone on your handlebar and the light on the back of your bike will uh, signal your phone and flash and make a noise if someone's approaching you fast from behind but i would say um be aware of those situations and if you you know can be comfortable riding on the shoulder further over the edge of the shoulder knowing how your bike is going to react and be, being comfortable getting off and on the highway those are kind of good things to to practice. They're not really, you know, needed very often, but um, like really, really, they're really, really uncommon, but um, it's just for building your confidence and being comfortable doing that. So you need to give you some tips. Um, otherwise, road has hazards and weather uh, approaching railway crossing. So we have a lot of railways uh, lines around town that, that the road doesn't cross at 90 degrees, like I think all along the search. Pershmont Highway, there's no 
is that the number of railway crossings and none of them are at 90. So always check that there's no one coming behind you and that, or in front of you um, and approach them at 90 degrees. Go right down, go over them, um, go to the shoulder again. Great potholes and objects, these are all things to slow down, um, move out when it's safe to do so. Beware that um, when it's on those really hot and humid days um, or on days when we have a lot of dew, there can be condensation on these things and they can be a lot more slippery than, um, than when they're dry. Debris and sand, can I get comfortable riding in those kinds of things? So again, avoid them. Know that for those uh, rain, frost, snow and ice things that, that make the surface more slippery, they also affect your bike function. So the bike might not break as well, probably won't shift as well if it's really cold. So be aware of those uh, kinds of things and just make sure that you're leaving yourself extra breaking distance and things like that. Um, sun angle is another one. So late um, in the fall, I always find this if I want to go for a ride after work. Um, I, I plan it around where the sun is setting and which way I'm riding at that time of day. So you know if you're riding into the sun and you can't see very well, but any motorists behind you probably aren't seeing you very well. So plan your route and your gear and that kind of thing accordingly. Um, also on the highway, high temperatures, it softens the asphalt a little bit. And sometimes where there's a lot of tar uh, repairs that have been done in the same direction that you're going, those can kind of grab your wheel and, and make it a little woozy. So um, be careful of those kinds of things. So bike handling skills are really important um, for avoiding accidents and for making you more comfortable on the road. These things are acquired by practicing. Obviously, I guess um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of videos online that you can watch to sort of improve your bike handling skills, and I'd really encourage you to check them out. Most of them are pretty short and fun. There's also subscriptions that you can get to different riders that are uh, like I think Ryan Leach, who's a Canadian famous trials rider, has a has a thing that you can subscribe to where you know he teaches you how to do wheelies and whatever else you want to do. Um, but those are good ways to improve your riding skills for mountain biking, road riding, and commuting. The other way is get out, um, you know, post COVID hopefully, and and ride with others. And we have a really great cycling club uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. It's uh, I think it's about thirty dollars to join. They organize events year round. Um, it's a great group of people. It's it's a really great way um, to learn how to do things if you're if you're open to asking questions and having other people give you tips, you know, everything about ready position and riding into obstacles and how to go over them and braking properly and cornering and all of those kinds of things. Group riding, if you want to ride in a group on the road, the cycling club is, is there for you. Um, find some friends who are more experienced cyclists, ask them and show you how to change the tire, all those kinds of, of things. So um, this is my last slide. And so in summary, Cycling probably isn't zero carbon. Um, it does mean that you're reducing your carbon footprint when you're riding a bike to replace other more intensive fossil fuel activities, but it, it takes food to fuel your bike and your bike itself and its parts have a life cycle associated with them. So take care of them so that you don't require as much maintenance and, and you're not as hard on, on the parts of your bike, I guess. Um, healthy, unprocessed or less processed, more plant-based, more local food choices uh, to fuel your riding will help you further reduce your carbon footprint. Um, I think there's lots of physical and mental health benefits to riding that hopefully have positive effects on the environment. We live in an amazing place to ride and I hope these tips will be useful and, and motivating to you so that you get out and ride. And remember, check out our, um, our local bike shops and local cycling clubs for with a lot more resources and information. Are there any questions? Oh, Rob, I think I can't, I can't hear you. Well, um, thanks so much there, Kim. And um, Kim will now take, uh, now take some questions, but just before that, and because I'm such a, a techno newbie and uh, wasn't able to get her last slide up there. Um, I'd just like to, to mention that Carter Dorsch 
will be doing the next presentation that's on July the 28th and he'll be talking about the Kensington Conservancy so please um, please consider joining us for that as well but uh, but right now um, that was excellent Kim and I learned all sorts of things that I've done wrong um, and I'm wondering if anybody else would has any questions so um, so please um, please join and, and ask Kim, uh, Kim any questions that you have. Oh, one thing I forgot to um, mention is I had all these great pictures in my talk, or I think they're great pictures of artwork by my friend Shannon Ramsey. So those are pretty things that she's done that she, she said I could use in my in my presentation to jazz it up a bit. So. Very nice. Uh, Ted, if you can, I'm not sure if you have to unmute people, but um, I see everybody is muted. Um, I'll start off with a question because um, I live on St. Joseph Island and I'm always wondering how to get from Sault Ste. Marie to St. Joseph. So with what you showed me in that one slide, I know now how to get to the, um, to the turnoff for the, um, for the large highway, but um, that's just outside of Sault Ste. Marie. But, but what's, a, what's a route you would recommend for that sort of a trip? So I think, I don't even map with it, and I haven't actually done the whole uh, trail myself. But there's that um, Great Lakes waterfront trail that's signed now all the way from Grocap to Sudbury and maybe beyond. Um, so for that, for riding to the island from my house, which is by Great Lakes Forestry Center, I would take Queen Street um, all the way to the end at Fournier, and then I would get on that trail that I showed you ride through Garden River. I love riding through Garden River. Um, it's pretty flat. People are so friendly. Um, and they're doing a lot of upgrades actually this year on the highway. So there's a big funding announcement. I'm not sure when those start or how they're going to affect cycling in the short term, but in the long term, I think it's going to be even better. Um, and then when you get to, um, so there's, yeah, I would say stay on Highway 17 all the way to Echo Bay and then take the Sylvan Valley turn off. So you cross the new highway and go north and then um, weave your way. So what is it? I'll have to send you a map route, but um, Pioneer Road to Government Road and I would go Government Road to all the way. You can get onto St. Joe Island without having to go back onto Highway 17. Mix, what's the road there? I don't have it in the top of my head. But, um, it's basically following those uh, the Great Lakes waterfront trail. Um, There's great riding on the island. Thank you. Did they, do they by any chance have a map like that for the waterway trail? I'm pretty sure there's a website and you can download maps for different sections of it. Okay. Thank you. Kim, any I have other a, questions? I have a question. I'm I'm curious. What would you recommend as the best way to signal a right turn if you're a bicycle rider? I use my right arm. If I've seen people try and signal left with their right arm up like this, so legally you can signal like this, um, you know, with your left arm up as if you are in a car, and that's where that comes from, right? Is yeah. Out of, out of car, but um, a right hand out is also a legal signal. And I think it's more direct, it's unambiguous, like cars know what you're doing when you point where you're going. So I, I do that. Okay. Um. If anyone else has questions, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, Kim. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering what you think about uh, the appetite for uh, a bike share program as possibly as part of the uh, uh, public transportation mix in the suit. Um, I'm not sure what your first name is. Tobin. I'm Tobin, sorry. Okay. Um, thanks, Tobin. It's a good question. So in my time here, I've seen bike share programs try to get off the ground a couple of times um, where there's been things like, well, they're not actually bike share programs, but I guess they're sort of 
free bike loan program. And um, one of those, there was something happening at the mill market a couple of years ago to try and get people on bikes. I don't know. I think they even have a tough time making a go of them in big cities, like making them feasible. They're, they're pretty heavily subsidized. So I really don't know how well, how well that, that would work in our city. Kim, it's Carmen. And I just want to start by saying what an awesomely wonderful presentation. And I really, really thank you for that. And I thank you for the connection to climate change as well. I'm wondering what is, in your view, the biggest drawback to encouraging people to use biking as a regular mode of transport, not as a recreational thing? I was really impressed to hear that you think that Sault Ste. Marie has got one of the best riding in, uh, bicycle infrastructures of many cities that you've been in. But I'd really be curious as to what do you think is the biggest impediment to getting people on, on the two wheels? Um, our cycling infrastructure, I think, is really, really good. I think it would make people feel safer if it followed some models where where there was a bigger divide between cars and bikes and better signage and things like that. Like there's some issues around town, like that one that I showed you on, on Black Road and Second Line right now, which hopefully it's going to be fine, but it puts cyclists in a, in kind of a dangerous spot if they don't know that, you know, they should ride over to the apron or, or things like that. Um, other situations where, you know, people are coming south on, uh, on the hub trail near, um, what is it, north, right by Sioux College there, you know, where it's hard for them to, you're not supposed to be riding on the sidewalk there and the hub trail kind of ends. So how do you get across the road and, and ride safely? There isn't a light specifically for you. So I think those sort of cycling structure, cycling infrastructure improvements are huge. And, and I do really commend, I think we have an amazing mayor and council for the kinds of things that have happened, you know, over the last couple of years for, for cycling, but those kinds of things, I, I think those improvements, like having the hub trail, um, that was huge for cycling in the city. Like that, you know, the number of people that I see riding now that never rode before the hub trail, that was huge. So I think those kinds of things, signage and that. And then, so a tiny bit more than that, I think showing people that they can do it. Um, mm -hmm. for, you know, everyone taking someone else out that doesn't ride regularly and showing them how fun it is and how easy it is and how it makes, you know, a trip to get a haircut, you know, um, an, an adventure, you know, it makes it much more fun than, than just, you know, going and, and doing, um, driving in your car, taking a bus or, or whatever. I didn't really talk about public transportation at all because I haven't really ever been a big user of it, even in big cities. It just didn't, it always makes me feel queasy. So I just didn't do it when I lived in Vancouver. Cool. Thank you. Well, Kim, I'm going to ask one more question here. Um, it's with re regard to routes, but, but getting downtown. If I say I wanted to go down to Queen or along Queen Street, go down to Queen Street, I'm I'm looking at the downtown core. Are there what's the best way to do that? I'm I've cycled down uh, Queen Street and um, it's great as long as there's that uh, cycling lane, but then I, it seems like you're taking your life in your hands. It does get a little bit like I would say you need to do it a little bit to get more comfortable with it because things do get a little bit crazy downtown. And I know that there was talk before of reducing the speed limit to 30 kilometers an hour and even maybe putting in a in a in a bike proper bike lane through downtown. And I don't I haven't been following, I don't know where that is at. I think that that would really improve the city a lot, in my personal opinion. But yeah, so riding downtown, I go down Queen Street, take the um the, you know, the nice bike lane most of the way down there and then when the bike lane and I take the lane through um through town so uh, through the heavy part of downtown coming home then 
I sometimes drive Bay Street or I'll, if I'm, you know, in a hurry, I'll be on Bay Street and then I'll cut through behind the Bush Plain Museum and cut out that intersection there and then come out um, by Algom Insurance or whatever. It's, so that's one of my cut throughs. But otherwise, I just take a hub trail if I'm not, not in a rush and, you know, go around by, by the waterfront. Any other question. questions for Kim? I have a question. Um, great presentation, by the way. Uh, my question is, I think what's really holding me back for using my bike other than just for recreation is that I'm concerned about it being stolen. So I don't know if you have any tips as far as locks, well, I guess I could find out locks as far as from the uh, bike shops, but any other tips you might have, whether to lock it to something or whatever, but that's always a concern for me. So yeah. I basically end up taking my vehicle. Yeah, so like I said, I know that we have a bike theft problem in town. That is not unique to St. Marie. That happens everywhere. Like um, I have friends in the Yukon and they say you can't leave your bike anywhere in Whitehorse. So, it's not just the Sault Ste. Marie thing. I would say talk to um, a bike bike shop person because they're hearing also about bikes that are getting stolen because people are contacting them and saying, hey, you know, do you have a record of my serial number and things like that? So, so they're aware of, of where things are at that way. Um, I like, uh, I showed a not great picture of it, but for most of my when I'm leaving my bike outside downtown on, on Queen Street or um, I'm walking it up, most of the places that I'm taking my bike, I, I'm thinking about it, but I, I use a, um, a pretty thick, heavy, um, very flexible ABUS um, combination lock that you can set your own combination to. And it sounds kind of flimsy when you say combination lock, but it's, it's pretty secure. It's not as secure as, I think there's all like the New York um, U bolt locks by kryptonite. Those things are, are very, very difficult to cut through. But um, I, I haven't yet had a problem with it. And I've left my bike at the mall and other places like that um, with that kind of lock. But I would really say get a lock that is, if you have a, you know, your, your bike is your everything, you know, it's, it's your mode of transportation. You want to kind of invest in that lock so that you don't lose your bike. Also, um, taking it inside in a lot of places. So if I have to go, like I can think of, I, I go to the, you know, if I go to the bank, I'll bring it inside with me to use it at the teller. Um, one thing that a friend of mine does, if he's leaving his bike somewhere, I don't know if he still does this, but he's a big commuter, is he always puts it in the hardest gear. And so it's really hard to get away on a bike when it's, it's in your biggest ring and your, your smallest gear in the back hard to get on it and, and get away quickly. Um, but then that can that can come back to bite you if you forget you've done that and you try and get on your bike and So those are the tips. Um, if you can take your bike inside, do that. Sometimes people have offered it, you know, I haven't thought like I've gone to great lengths to lock my bike up at my dentist where there's no actual, you know, um, bike locking station. And then they see me walking, you know, with my helmet and stuff. And they're like, oh, you can bring your bike inside. So, you know, ask at businesses and things like that. Those are the only tips. That I'm okay, thank you. I hope you didn't jinx yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim, I see Isabel uh, Soulier put in the chat, it would be nice if uh, cars weren't allowed to park on Queen Street. Uh, maybe a comment from you, but maybe on a broader, from a broader perspective, is there any active um, um, lobbying of, of city council going on to increase the uh, availability or the, you know, the possibility of biking in, in the suit? I'm really not sure of that, Rob. Um, that would be a good thing for, for people who are interested in that to talk to their councillors about, um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. Right now, one thing I'll say about riding downtown is you can always, if the traffic is hairy, like if it's too 
it's too much for you. Get on, get on the sidewalk and walk your bike. You know, it's um, it's another option. Downtown isn't that big; it won't take you that long to to walk your bike. It's also, you know, yeah, I would consider doing that. Right. Well, if, <clears throat> if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank you again, Kim, for that. Uh, excellent presentation and um, we look forward to uh, having people back for in a month's time that's on the 28th of July. Carter Dorsch will be talking about the Kensington Conservancy and um, and there are various relationships there with, with land conservation and climate change and biodiversity and all those sorts of things and um, he may even be taking us on a virtual tour but um, so hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye.